And we want to welcome to the podcast, Megan Swizon. Uh, you got uh, it right. I've, Perfect. I've, I've, I've had to practice. I, I mean, her name <laughs> starts with a Z, and so, but it's Swizon. <laughs> and so, what we're gonna do now, uh, since it's, I want to call her Megan Z, since she's on Bob Z Uncut, I'm now. Perfect. I now dub you Megan Z. We're family. So we're family now. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. All right. So, um. Megan is a candidate for a City of Norfolk Commonwealth's attorney position. Yes, sir. She's going to tell us all about her uh, experience in the Norfolk Commonwealth's attorney's office, as well as her 24 years experience as a prosecutor. So um, before we do that, I just want to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Thank you for and, having um, me. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, and how, so how do you view your candidacy for the Norfolk Commonwealth's attorney's office? Okay. Right now. And I mean, like right now, uh, in today's climate of cr the criminal justice system, excuse me, right now in the, today's climate of the criminal justice system, it appears to be only two types of participants in the criminal justice system. It's only two. You, you got your heroes and you, and you got your villains. Notwithstanding the victims, but, you know, just the participants, you got your heroes and you got your villains in the criminal justice system. So um, what do you think about that characterization? I actually, I hate that characterization. I, I know where it comes from, um, but in, in my life and in my career, you can't break anybody down into a simple label. And that's a mm. lot of where we have broken down our communication. So, you know, I even say about defendants all the time, and especially the attorneys I train, a lot of the people come before us are not bad people. They may have done something bad, and you have to change how you think. You know, mm. very few of the defendants that I have prosecuted have I looked at and said, that's a bad person. And I'll tell you, those tend to be some of my pedophiles, right? My ch child molesters. Mm. Oftentimes, people are, you know, victims of circumstance, or they've made some bad decisions, and it doesn't mean they shouldn't be held accountable to the highest extent if it's something like murder or, or rape. But it doesn't mean they're not human. And when we look at anybody as a hero and villain, mm -hmm. we automatically label them and lose an objective way of looking, whether that's law enforcement or someone who is accused. Right. Because right? the way you look at law enforcement, you can label villain or hero. Same with the accused. And the moment we do that, mm -hmm. we forget that what we're supposed to be doing is looking at everything objectively and everyone under their particular circumstance. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's how I've I mean, tried to always do my job. And, I know, and <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, growing up in my neighborhood, I mean, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that, like, when we saw the police, we ran. Mm -hmm. Whether we did something wrong or not. Automatic, and, I, and I'm not anti-police. Uh, no, and, and I wouldn't try to argue that that wasn't what was happening. Um, I just think we need to yeah, be well. aware of that and talk to each other. So, for instance, you know, having this conversation, that is mm -hmm. one of the positives that I think we've had, you know, use the term in these times. One of the positives is people are willing to have those conversations now. I don't know. I think some, some criminals are villains, and I think some police are villains, and I think some police okay. are heroes, and some people that, that are regular. I, you know, I just, I mean, we can just agree to disagree. Okay. Let's move to the next question. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's just, um, you know, um, if you, if, if you know, uh, I guess we should say, they burnt, they earned that bump like a mug. You know, some people earn that bump, you know, mm -hmm. so I mean, I got to give it to them. I'm not going to be out here and say, well, you know, uh, and it's going to lead up to our next question. But, you know, if you you stand in somebody, your knee on somebody's neck, you a villain. Yes. You yes. a villain. And I, mean, and I agree 100 well, percent with that. It, right. If so, you're going to talk about individual people, I, I can am. see those labels. I'm, I'm sort of talking about in general, if nah. we just decide one group or another group. No, I said two type of participants. You got the villains 
and your heroes. I mean, and I, and I mean, I know it's deeper than that. That's that's all generalization. Mm-hmm. And I get where you're coming from. I'm not trying to um, beat you over your head with that. But in, anyway, but I did notice that your candidacy was, um, as well as your career as a uh, prosecutor, was based upon your desire to advocate for the victims, which is not, you know, another uh, another part of what I didn't talk about the the victims. I talked about uh, heroes and villains, but victims, you know, and so. We know that this uh, is is a lot more complicated, but what makes your approach to victimization um, any different than business as usual? Because what I've heard, especially coming out of Norfolk, is the communication level with victims. And that's my approach is very victim-centered in the sense of we might not always be able to go forward on the case, and they don't direct what we do, but they deserve a conversation. They deserve the respect to know what's happening in their case. And, and that's where I end up sometimes on my own cases being the victim advocate because I believe our job is public service. And if our job is public service, then we have to be willing to spend time with victims of crime and, and sit down and talk to them, especially if we're not be able to go forward on their cases. Megan, I, I mean, I feel you. I agree with you. Um, and, I've, and, you know, your name precedes you. Your name precedes you, and, and that's one of the reasons I want to get you on the show. I know I have some some of my friends that you know may have crossed your path, and you know, and 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 I, they would tell me about you, and I'm like, nah, the prosecutor dog. <laughs> Let's make clear that the, the, they will they would tell you positive things. No, they said the, no, they saying like the prosecutor like looked out, and I was like, the prosecutor. So why are you paid a lawyer? And I was just kidding. <laughs> But he said, they said that the, the prosecutor, you know, had had their back. So I was like, wow. So, you know, just wanted to kind of kind of give you a little little shout out there that your, you. your reputation as a as a fair person precedes you. So I mean, um, Thank so you. that's why I was you know really uh, you know glad to have you on the show. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about uh, the national level. Um, mm-hmm. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill, uh, House Bill uh, 7120, he has passed the House, and we're trying to get Republicans <laughs> on board <laughs> in the Senate. Um, this bill includes provisions that would uh, uh, ban no knock warrants, which is what happened with um, Breonna Taylor, mm-hmm. uh, chokeholds of any kind, which we know mm-hmm. um, happened with George Floyd and Eric Garner, you know, um, uh, but today, I think that um, one of the one of the things the, the the major sticking point on that bill is um, uh, qualified immunity for police officers. Mm-hmm. So please explain to our audience because I mean, it's, it's a lot of people hear that phrase all the time. What is qualified immunity? But please explain to um, how you feel about it and how, and what it is. So I will preface this with knowing that my opinion is probably not going to be the most. Um, popular in this. I completely agree with almost all of the reforms in, the, in that bill. Um, and thankfully, Virginia has already taken the steps necessary for, for a lot of those reforms. So qualified immunity is the idea. It's a civil concept. It's not a criminal concept. So um, we can still go after officers who, who break the law. But qualified is, immunity is the idea that if an officer violates someone's rights, mm-hmm. um, they can't be sued civilly. Be- right, by the nature right. of their job, because by the nature of their job, we sort of recognize some decisions are going to be made that are, are wrong. Now, what I will tell you, and this is something I tell everybody, I will always answer questions, and I can't promise everyone's going to like my answers. That's okay. I don't favor getting rid of qualified immu- mm. immunity. And, and the reason why is especially the way it was drafted in Virginia. So it was passed in Colorado, right? You know that. The Colorado bill required the officer to at least knowingly violate someone's rights, and that's absolutely 100% wrong, right? And when that can be proved, there's a lot of courts that have said, yep, you lose your, your qualified immunity when you, when you do something knowingly violating those rights. The way Virginia has it is, you know, it can be done accidentally, it can be done good faith. And my concern is that some of the argument is similar to the argument for the death penalty. They, you know, it's going to be a deterrent. Officers will act correctly. Hmm. Well, we know with the death penalty, you know, people did not think about that when they were committing a murder. 
So when you've got officers who are making split second decisions, Mm -hmm. they're not thinking about, I may get sued for this. Unfortunately, ahead of time, they might. And Norfolk specifically, and this is why I have to have this comp, this belief for Norfolk, we're already 100 officers down. Um, and they're not lawyers. I can't tell you how many times officers have come into my office and have done a search. And, I've, and they thought they did everything right. And they, they had that belief. And I've looked at them and say, nope, bad search. Mm. You know, they're not attorneys. And, and that's where I, I think we need to structure, if we're going to do something like that, we need to structure it better. Mm. Well, uh, I mean, I, I guess on the other side of that coin, you could look at places, let's say, where they don't have, quali- let's say, Illinois. Chicago paid out a half a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Would it be? You know, a half a billion towards lawsuits that went back and the taxpayers had to pay. Mm-hmm. Be- you know, and I'm not saying like the, uh, that the police officers, they would have sued had that money either. But it, they ended, the city itself ended up paying for, you know, uh, if they can't sue the police officers, then they just sue the police department. Mm-hmm. And, 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 that, and that happens. So. And in some respects, that's the correct way because the police department is who has to be held responsible for getting bad officers on, off the streets and for how they train them. So you don't think that that's a deterrent for, I mean, I, I don't know what's going to be a deterrent because right after the George mm-hmm. Floyd verdict, the next... The rest of the week, somebody got killed every day the rest of the week. And that's, I I wish I had an answer. I I, I didn't. um, I do. I I understand everybody's arguments, and I wish I had an answer. Um, The other things that you mentioned, I am 100% in favor for. I've been in in favor for long before this became Mm. a discussion. It's just that particular issue is where where I differ on some things. Right. And so, like, when you said the, um, the officers thought they did a good search, and, and I, I was reading somewhere that the firearms training for recruits is like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Two weeks. Then they give you, you know, they give you a gun and go out and say, you know, go and hit the community. We've trained you for two weeks, right? And so um, I've long been an advocate to say, and, and people don't say, well, the training is wrong. Mm-hmm. And then I talked to, I had conversations with um, not this chief of police, but the prior chief of police and this current sheriff. They say, hey. If you want to, um, one thing, you, you, you know, you're not getting, you're saying we can't get, they told me we couldn't get African-American candidates because they had records. They couldn't get a large pool of African-American. But what I told them, I said, hey, you got uh, ODU, well, ODU, Hampton, Norfolk State, Virginia Wesleyan, Christopher Newport, Elizabeth City, and each semester they graduate uh, a, a plethora of African American young men and women with criminal justice degrees. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was one of them. Right. From ODU. <laughs> okay. But I know. I, 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 behold. <laughs> 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 Don't play with me. But uh, <laughs> so um, no, but I, I mean the whole thing is like you know you, if you want to um, that's one job that you think of. I mean. Look, look at the teachers. They have to go through four years, get certified. You don't even have to have a college degree to be a um, policeman. And so when you say, I didn't know the search was bad, yeah, because you ain't go to school to learn the Constitution, to learn, you know, you have Fourth Amendment rights. Mm-hmm. So how do you, you know, it's, 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 it's from recruiting to training. So all of these things play, play a part in it. Absolutely. I, and I, there's nothing you said that I disagree with. Unfortunately, as the Commonwealth's attorney, I'll speak out about it, but I don't. I wish yeah. I did. I don't control the police department right. or advise them. That would be the city attorney about trainings and, true, and liability. Um, but y'all like cousins? No. <laughs> we work together, but we're not. You know. <laughs> oh man, I'm on a roll. Um, <laughs> it's okay. So um, okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Not knowing what our elected officials. Stand for. I've always I've been an advocate for this, right? Because mm-hmm. I know people that have been elected since I've you know been around, uh, like the town crier, uh, you know, Paul. If the British are coming, you know, I mean, I've been I've been trying to sound it long, and so like we knew Obama was for um, what uh, health care. We knew mm-hmm. Obamacare. You know, we knew that every, every um, 
just about every uh, politician, even even Trump, build a wall. I mean, every politician generally has a um, a pet, you know, thing you know, that we know them by. But I think for our local and some of our state representatives, you know, if, if I was going to run, they would say, well, he's about education and, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and mm. different things that they would know that would be pa- I would be passionate about. But um, what would... What would citizens know you for? So what I would hope they would know me for is that I am a true public servant. And what that means is I represent everybody in the city, not just one side, Mm -hmm. not just one ideal. Um, And when you're a public servant, it's not about the title. It's about showing up every day for the people. Um, So beyond, you know, along with that, it's about kids for me. I have spent years working with programs specifically to keep kids away from court. If we can keep kids out of the system, that's so much of the problems wiped out right there. Mm-hmm. You know, we know that that just starts so many different things on paths that just don't end up in, right. in, in a correct way. So, you know, those are the two things. I truly believe I came into this job as a public servant, not as a prosecutor. You know, that's my job, but that's not how I viewed it. Right. Um, and I just think that we need to do everything we can for kids. Okay. I mean, so we're going to, so what would be your knowledge plan? So it'd be that she's a servant. She's a yes. servant. Yes. This, this, this woman has a servant heart. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, I, I worked for a while with second chances. Um, and I was the employment specialist and my job was to go and get, uh, people who were just coming out of prison mm-hmm. as I had to find them employment. And like, that was my job. And I was like, okay, so, uh, you know, I'm going to get this blood from this stone just in a moment, you know. But I agree with you with the servants. I felt like that I needed to serve. You know, I had a, I had a servant's heart. And it's like, well, you know, please, please, please give my clients a job. Mm-hmm. You know, give them a chance. You know, that's what it's all about. So, And I, I think if you start with a servant heart, you're willing to listen to people, too. Mm-hmm. You don't go in thinking... I know all about everything. It's if I'm going to be of service to you, I need to hear what it is you need first. Right. You know, and I think that's, if anything, even in my career, those who I've mentored, anything, that's what I want to be most thought of as. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. Now, this next question is kind of a question and it, just, it's, it's, it blew me away because I thought I was dreaming when I heard it on uh, about probably like two weeks ago. They said that um, during the coronavirus pandemic, at the height of the pandemic last year, uh, uh, the state's attorney for Maryland, uh, actually uh, for Baltimore, but her name is Marilyn Mosby. And you know, a lot of people, we heard of her from the Freddie Gray uh, right. incident when uh, Freddie Gray, she was one of the people who were in the system that was advocating to uh, charge the police. Mm-hmm. Um, but she announced, and this, uh, this blew me away, Marilyn Mosby, the state's attorney for Baltimore announced in the city would no longer prosecute drug possession, prostitution, uh, trespassing, and other minor charges to keep people out of jail and to uh, limit the spread of the violence. I mean, um, of, of, of the virus, excuse me. Uh, virus, violent crime went down 20%. So she then said Baltimore is going to continue um, to decline prosecution of, and I just... All drug possession, prostitution, minor traffic, and misdemeanor case. So, I, I you know, it's, just, it's some cases to be made for that. I don't know if, if you want to just open the gates. For, <laughs> for, for well, first thing I'll say, so my husband's getting his doctorate. He just became a doctoral candidate in, okay. in mental health counseling. And what he would say to me is, correlation doesn't mean causation. Right. <laughs> you know, and... Um, I think we always have to look at things outside of the vacuum. What is truly, you know, keeping people from committing crime or is it that people are not getting arrested because I don't think officers should waste their resources if they know a case is not going to go forward. So we have to look at all of that, but there are going to be some crimes that we decide maybe as a community, we don't want to, you know, put the full press of the law behind. Right. Um, you know, the problem uh, we have, and one of the things that I, I, you and I can do a whole nother podcast about is so many things we wouldn't have to bring into the criminal justice system if we had services 
right. for people. So, you know, I was always an advocate for getting rid of charging prostitutes, right? There, to me, as a um, people person who works with sexual assault and, and children, that to me was victimizing more. But that's the problem is there's no resources for people who are being human trafficked right. unless they get picked up on prostitution sometimes. Mm. So it, it's if we want to stop criminalizing things, we have to be able to create places and resources that people feel safe to do outside of the system. So is that uh, along the lines of defunding the police or... Or, you know, or, it, or, yeah, or, if you're referring to defunding the police I mean, not, as to... Not as, a, yes. not as a statement, because everybody knows right. that's Right, they, they, they used the wrong terms. I mean, if, if, they, yeah, if they had used, you yeah, know, it's, it's, it's crazy, reprioritizing... Reprioritizing, because that's what they're saying. They say, that's okay, what it really... <laughs> well, if you have um, an organization, a nonprofit or something that knows uh, uh, certain, you know, communities of women are, you know, getting traffic and stuff mm -hmm. like that, or, you know, have resources, then maybe you... You may not want to, um, you know, uh, send a whole, you know, police cruiser take away when mm -hmm. somebody's getting robbed and, and, and beaten or stabbed or whatever and, and, and use, you know, for different situations. Yep. That, because the police can't be a, a mental health workers. They can't. Exactly. You know, and they're asked to do that a lot of times. They're asked to do mm -hmm. all these things. That they have, you know, if they, they don't, don't even know a search, well, the search warning, <laughs> you know, they're going to they don't know. Nothing don't about. use those words against me. <laughs> you said, you opened that line of questioning. I did, I did, didn't I? Uh, but no, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, reprioritizing budgets, that's, that's got to be top of the list when we're looking at these things. And, and for all the good officers that I've worked with in my career, none of them want to victimize the victim. Mm -hmm. You know, if they could just focus on what we grew up as thinking police work was, which was, you know, those who are getting hurt, we want to stop that versus hurting those who are getting hurt more. Right, right. Well, you know, moving to my next question or situation, and it's almost like, you know, um, let's talk William, Lieutenant William, William Kelly, Norfolk mm -hmm. Police Officer, fired for helping fundraise for uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was the, the kid who... Uh, open fire in uh, in Wisconsin uh, to kill protesters, shot mm -hmm. protesters, and so when we see that he uh, was fired for um, participating in a fundraiser and using city um, email to do mm -hmm. it, you know allegedly, um, you know all we say is mm -hmm, told you. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm because no, you're right. You're right, and that's why and, the city made right. the decision they they made. It doesn't, you know. I refuse, and, and I've told my ODU students and my law students this for years. I tend not to comment on cases that aren't mine because I've seen how the media can portray them. So I don't know, you know, the real details of Kyle Rittenhouse, but I know what he has come to represent. Right. Right. And so the problem with what Lieutenant Kelly did, and I was surprised because I had cases with Lieutenant Kelly. So the problem with what he did is exactly why the city had to make the decision they did. He made a comment trying to represent all law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And right. we already have those trust issues for exactly what right. you said, yeah. right? For exactly what you said. And right. that does not and after this Help podcast, anybody. if I get pulled over, I'm going to roll to the nearest uh, gas station or well lit area. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I know it's funny. But, but no, I mean, I, I get what you're saying is that um, even, even um, everyone is saying the same thing. They're saying, you know, when, when uh, after uh, the, the gentleman got shot um, the day after the verdict, we were saying, it's going to happen again. Mm hmm Lo and behold, Elizabeth City, I mean, and that's all we always say. Well, you know what's going to happen again. I mean, every, but everything has a breaking point. You know, well, I thought, you know, they thought George Floyd was a breaking point, you know, but. And I think just to get your comment on this, um, mm -hmm. Trevor Noah said it's, 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 it's the system. It's not that our bad apples, apples is that the, the tree. tree is rotten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the tree is rotten. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? I think the best we can do at this stage is really dig our feet in and our heels in on holding everybody accountable and mm. just continue to do it. We are a nation of extremes and we expect one thing to fix everything and that's never going to happen. And we think one incident represents every incident and, and that's not the case. We need to dig our heels in and say, I am holding you accountable. 
Mm. And hopefully over time, that will become the norm as opposed to non-accountability non or non-accountability. I'm tired. You know, not holding someone accountable. Unaccountable? No, I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> you got me confused. <laughs> um, so, no, really, but okay, speaking of accountability, the police, I mean, uh, in the oceanfront, they had a night of madness, I guess, a, a month ago. And uh, involved the shooting of uh, Donovan Lynch. He was shot and killed by the police. And they still haven't released his name. Mm -hmm. You know, but they released Donovan Lynch, Lynch's name the next day as if he was, uh, you know, one of the people who were, you know, um, creating the problems. Here's my issue. Here's my issue with that. Perhaps you can help me with it. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. But, I don't um, know. No, I'm kind of over the top, but I mean, I just, I'm, I'm tired. I'm a black I, man in America. I'm tired of this. I'm, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, I have trauma. And the only reason why I said maybe is I wish I had the answers for everything. I, I have trauma. Mm -hmm. And so everybody knows, everybody knows his name. Everybody knows his name. Mm -hmm. It's allegedly Officer Simmons. Everybody knows his name. And everybody knows that he knew him. He went to um, Salem High School with him. Everybody knows this. And I talked to the people in the mainstream media. I talked to... Um, Channel 10, Channel 3, I talked to the lady who wrote the story for Virginia Pilot, and I'm like, why won't you release his name? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, we haven't got a, an affirmative com, uh, um, uh, uh, confirmation from the police department. Where are the investigative reporters? And the point is that it's just no transparency. So why do, why are you like saying, okay, you got to trust, you know, we need you to trust. We need you to trust, but. I don't think that's the right answer anymore. I, I agree with you. I don't think that's enough anymore. And I think um, people deserve more. Now, I am not going to totally make a comment on Virginia Beach. That's not my purview. No. But if, you know, if, if that was something that happened here, I can tell you the chief and I would be having discussions about transparency. Um, and again, the chief would have to also follow what the city attorney did. All I could do is offer an opinion. Okay. The city attorney, just like in Virginia Beach, is probably the one advising law enforcement as to when to release. And if their investigation isn't complete, that's probably what the advice is. I, I'm not there, and I'm very always clear about that. Um, but I, I think you're right. I, I, that's the problem I have with a lot of these questions is all I can do is say, yeah, you know, I wish I, wish I had a way to turn it around. All I can do it is be me at this, you know, each time I get a chance to make a decision. Okay. Well, it takes me to our last question. If you are elected to the office of the Commonwealth Attorney, uh, you say if you wish, if you had a magic wand, on day one, mm -hmm. what, would be, what is the first thing you would do uh, to uh, policy-wise, day one, and then after your first 100 days in office, what would you do? And that's very timely because the pilot had an article today that sort of had our, our first three things, and it was hard to limit to three because there's so many things. I beat them to it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, you know, talking about transparency, it's going to take a while because of budget and technology, but the first thing I want to get started is what's called a data dashboard so that the Commonwealth attorney has a place where any citizen can go online and see the demographics of who's a victim, who's being prosecuted, what those crimes are for, where they're happening. So it's full transparency. And that's a way to keep us in check. And it's a way to keep, you know, it, citizens informed as to, as to what's happening. And also talk about information on, on that as to what other programs, what are things we're trying to do, like a constant information. The other things I want to do is start what's called a trying to think of the right term that I used in the paper because I had a couple different things I wanted to call it and I settled on justice and professionalism committee. Mm. Um, we need to start teaching the young attorneys mm -hmm. earlier about things um, and we need to have regular discussions in the office about racial, social biases, all the things that people think they know about but don't because they're not talking about it. Right. You know, the other things I want to do is really do an audit of victim witness and find out what services are we providing to victims and how we can improve those. Well, that's great. Well, we have we have been speaking with Megan Swizon. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love it. Say, I have to do it. I asked her uh, earlier. I said, well, "Could you send me that phonetically?" And um, <laughs> she, she sent it to me. So, 
I'm going to give you an opportunity now to talk about your website or give yourself a plug or let us know a little bit, of, you know, you're running for and, and when, you know, whatever you want to say. Thank you. So my website is meganforcommonwealth.com. You can go on there and find out more about me. We don't have time. I'm, I'm the oldest of all the candidates, so it would take me a lot longer to, to give you my, my life background. And there's a lot on there. I tend to be an open book and I, I tend to talk too much, so I'll make this quicker. Um, I've been doing this 24 years. I came into this job for victims. It was because of an experience of my best friend in 10th grade. And ever since then, I thought, if I have a voice, I'm going to use it for those who have been victimized. But I also came into this for the exact reasons you've been asking me these questions today. My parents were social activists. The idea that I was going to be a prosecutor and I was going to work for the man just blew my dad you know, away. <laughs> um, he still is proud, but... Um, so I didn't come into this job being idealistic about what the problems with the system are. And I still managed to be a successful prosecutor um, and be fair. And that's, you know, I was thankful you brought up the fact that, you know, you have friends that have talked about, I don't just look at a case, right. the charges, and I don't just look at who the defendant is. I want to know all of the information. And that's who you will have as your prosecutor, someone who has that at the top and trains all their attorneys and holds them to that that level of responsibility as well. Well, thank you very much for coming out, Megan. Uh, we want to thank you guys for uh, checking us out on Uncut with Bob Z, Community Views. And until next time, have a great day.